This conference will now be recorded. All right, great. Thank you everybody for joining us today on this happy Monday in December. Uh, we're gonna get started. Um, we did have the agenda that was sent out to us that we all hopefully were able to review. Um, we did have the November 16 um, meeting minutes in there. If there are any edits that you guys have, um, please just let um, Dr. Cog staff know. Um, we don't need approval of the minutes, but they're there for reference. Um, and then the first thing on our agenda is actually the community-based transportation planning briefing. And um, I felt like this would be a good presentation specifically for this group because we've been talking a lot about what could um, community-based transportation planning look like. Um, and I think it's important that we all start, you know, with a, a clear understanding of what that means. Because I, I have to admit that maybe I, I'm not entirely um, 100% sure on what the idea is. I, I, I think I do, but I would like us all to have that foundation to build off of. And so I asked um, Doug to, to put together a great presentation for us to, to kind of walk through and set that foundation. So take it away. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair, very, very much. Um, Melinda, can you pull that up? Lynn is efforting because if I got to do it, we're all in trouble. Uh oh, sorry, Doug. I'm... No, the okay. person who well... controls the screen. Okay. It's actually a, a rare talent, honestly. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. So I have like multiple screens set up, so it's like, which screen am I showing now? <laughs> there it is. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. All right, we're good, we're good. Hey, just FYI, uh, Lise Jones, she sent uh, uh, an email a few minutes ago and she's running late, but she's hoping to get in, just, just kind of FYI. Okay, well, um, no, thank you all very much and appreciate the opportunity. And first, I, let me apologize for not being at the last meeting. My, uh, my youngest daughter, we were just talking about kids. My long, youngest daughter, she had a couple hip surgeries uh, last at, on the last meeting day, and it got kind of crazy in the afternoon, but everything went good. So we're we're very thankful of that, and I would like to thank Ron for stepping in at the last minute, and uh, he did a great job as always. So so thank you very much, Ron. So when um, when Chair Mullick and I were discussing the agenda of uh, of, of a couple of weeks ago, um, Julie mentioned that she she had this you know profound interest in getting like a primer on community based transportation planning. And I'll be honest, I really didn't know much about it. Um, you know, but being in the planning world for some time, I've like, you know, I've heard of the term, but I did really truly didn't have a clear understanding. So I did some research and and tried to apply apply that conversation, well, apply that concept to the conversations that we've been having around the RTD governance and um and questions we we are always trying to answer the, the one one question we're always trying to answer, which is what problem are we trying to solve? Melinda, next slide, please. Yeah, so it it became clear that that a program or initiative like community-based transportation planning um, could be a product that would really resolve, at least in part, some of the questions that have been expressed as as you consider the um, uh, governance options, like for example, you know we've had quite a bit of conversation about um, interest in local communities and residents having an elevated voice in transit service planning. Um, and you know, and this this next bullet, you know, kind of speaks to um, a point that uh, Mayor Malay has made several times about you know the concept of having these sub-regional councils, but they still adhere to a higher regional policy directives of RTD board. And uh, I, I, you could envision a scenario in which these community-based transportation program initiatives will kind of kind of have that element. Um, it truly does um, have equity considerations as part of, part of its uh, planning initiative. Um, and it would really help, I believe, in us building back the loss of confidence and or trust, and not just in RTD, but, but quite frankly, in government alone. And also, selfishly, from Dr. Cog's perspective, I mean, we've had a couple conversations myself and Ron have had over the past several days, 
And uh, we're really interested in utilizing this approach for our own planning purposes. So next slide, Melinda. So what is it exactly? Well, it's, um, it's a process that has really truly yielded better collaboration and communication around needs. Um, this is primarily, you, I mean, there's been a lot of work done in this area out in, out in the state of California, most notably in the San Francisco Bay Area, and they've done an unbelievable amount of work, a lot of innovative thought that's gone into this. But more specifically, what it is, it's a grassroots approach that brings residents and community-based organizations and transportation folks um, together to identify low-income neighborhood transportation challenges, but probably more importantly is to develop strategies to try to overcome them. Um, it's, uh, it's very pointed in working with these community-based organizations or CBOs, um, and it makes a lot of sense, right, because, you know, they already have a, a vested interest in the communities. Um, uh, you know, because of their, they're really on the ground and have a, have a profound uh, understanding of the needs, um, they, uh, um, you know, it, it just makes a, a lot of sense to to actually to work close in hand with them, promote some more equitable, balanced, and reasonable process as a result. And I know, I believe Daya's on the line now. I, I'll be interested to get Daya's take on all this when we get a little, when we get into this a little more, um, because I know in Daya's day job, she kind of does some of this work, and I'd be interested to, to see how, um, how we might be able to implement it as part of our recommendations. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry. So as I mentioned, California by far and away is a leader in this community-based transportation planning process stuff. It's, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it is being, beginning to be implemented across the country, but it's only in pockets. Um, and like I said, the Bay Area has done some tremendous uh, innovative stuff. There's 30 communities in the Bay Area that have completed uh, plans, and the plans all have the following components. So there's a demographic analysis of the area. Um, there's a list of transportation prioritized gaps and barriers. Um, those are identified, uh, strategies and solutions to address those gaps, an identification of possible funding sources, which is always the most difficult, of course, um, list of stakeholders to implement the plan and documented results of the public outreach. I, you know, with regards to the funding, um, I, I'll just say this, that, you know, we're always in search of funding. It doesn't matter if we're talking about transportation or, or, or some other initiative. But I've had conversations with uh, several elected officials who've, you know, at least indicated um, that if, you know, if, if they had a better understanding of um, you know, how those monies were going to be utilized from a public transportation perspective within their own communities or counties, that they would have a um, they would be intrigued by providing more local funding, um, you know, kind of offset the cost for for in particular stuff like we're uh, we're suggesting as part of this community-based planning work. Um, next slide, please. So just to give you an example, um, this is this is Marin City. Uh, Jackie, did I say that right? Nope, it's Marin. Uh, Mar Marin? Okay, Marin City. Jackie's from the Bay Area, by the way. <laughs> so yeah, so this is just an example of the, Marin City is one of the one of the communities that had completed their community-based uh, transportation plan. And um, these are some of the initiatives that they have indicated as uh, ones that have gotten um, grassroots support for. Community shuttle loop, that sounds familiar, Mayor Malay, probably in your community. Um, a shuttle to hospital and medical facilities, a voluntary driver program, um, taxi voucher program, and subsidies for transit paratransit service. And they're now working through some of these initiatives now to try to come up with funding solutions. But of course, like all like all initiatives, right? I mean, you know, it doesn't make there's not much to talk about unless you have you you've identified what the problems are. So that's what they have done. And um, uh, this is again just one example of 30 plus communities within the Bay Area that have completed such initiatives. And one of the one of the other 
benefits of this process is that um, you know you just don't complete the plan and just let it sit on a shelf and don't don't revisit. Um, they're required as part of this this um, um, initiative to actually go back and report out on what has been done or what is planning to be done in order to address these these concerns. Next slide, please. So that's really all I had today. I didn't I didn't want to take up too much time having conversation about this, but I think more than anything, um, you know, the real true purpose of the presentation was really just to kind of show you the potential work sub-regional councils can undertake and how how they can can be utilized for 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 the greater good. Um, you know, it's, it's initiatives such as this, which I think would be you know very complex to do at the regional level, whether it be RTD or Dr. Cog or whomever. You know, if, if we, Dr. Cog, were interested in doing this type of exercise, I think we would work through our sub-regional forums that we've created. Um, it's just that they're closer, obviously, to to the to the work. And um, you know, I just think there's it's just an example of of the of of a way that we could utilize um our our sub-regional councils if they were developed that's all i got i'd be happy to, to to try to answer any questions you might have about the the subject itself or um i'd be interested in any discussion you might have might want, might want to have about it thanks madam chair great thank you any questions right off for doug so doug one of the questions that i have is how are metrics used in planning um, some of these types of models? Do you have any examples or any ideas around that? Yeah, so um, I, I'll just use Marin City again. Um, and they, as part of, they had a matrix established that kind of set priorities of, um, of each of the, well, one of the challenges and kind of rank ordered those challenges. And then, um, you know the the solutions or pro possible solutions they have. They you know they they kind of did this whole whole exercise of matching the two together. Um, but with regards to metrics as to completion or or the um, you know removing those barriers or challenges, Julie, is that what you meant? Yeah, or just in general, like how do we know we're succeeding? How do we know that we're we're meeting our needs of our community um, and you know, what is that kind of measure of success moving forward? How, what does that look like? That's a great question. I, I don't, I don't know if I remember seeing anything specifically about that, um, but I'll look a little deeper and see. I got some contacts out at MTC as well, Metropolitan Transportation Commission out in the Bay Area, and I'll ask them specifically about metrics. Okay. And, and Jackie. Doug so oh, yeah, it's so uh, Doug kind of referenced the city of Lone Tree has been operating what we're calling the Lone Tree Link, and it's a free shuttle service uh, within the city of Lone Tree, um, and it's an on-demand service. We pre-COVID it was operating um, it initially seven days a week. We really weren't getting much usage on Sunday, but so six days a week and. Um, some of the metrics that we looked at for success were actually kind of locations where people were going. We have found, we thought people were going to be using it mostly for a first and last mile to and from light rail, and that certainly is happening. But people are actually using it to get to the grocery store. People are using it to get to Sky Ridge Hospital. Um, we've had people using it actually to get to the schools and the libraries. So in addition to the ridership numbers, and we, we saw, so it's a, it was a nine passenger shuttle, uh, and we were seeing ridership of up to nine folks and some commuting by it just within the city. We do have a very large employer base. And so instead of people taking their cars, uh, some of from our multifamily housing options, I think at one point we had like nine folks going to Schwab from the city so instead of nine cars on our road so i think when we talk about metrics there's different you know so we're getting people to grocery stores medical care uh libraries and schools but we're also taking cars off of our roads so i, I think metrics mm -hmm. also depend on the community and how the community what successes of uh, problems or challenges the community is trying to address very good yeah but i mean <laughs> I mean, I'll just throw this open to the group. I mean, how cool would it be, though, for you know, for 
for sub-regional councils to work on this approach. So that this would be, you know, could be a policy directive from the RTD board that each sub-regional council perform one of these um, community-based transportation plans. Um, and then, you know, it, and it did, quite frankly, it helps in addressing some of the gaps and barriers that exist in our communities that we all know. I, I just think it's a great, great opportunity. It would be a very good collaborative between the sub-regional councils and the, and the RTD board. Just a thought. Yeah, and I think, oh, go ahead, Dea. I see you're muted. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and thank you for the presentation, Doug. This was really helpful. And I, I will admit, I'm certainly intrigued. Um, given the focus on low-income communities, I think the one thing that was lifted up within Reimagine RTD was that we really need to serve the folks that are actually writing. I, I think one question that I have is around um, how this planning process shows up in the exurbs of the Bay Area. And I'm, I'm thinking specifically of Vallejo um, and a few of the other communities that are a little further out where maybe the density doesn't exist. So I don't know if maybe that's, uh, if, if we can dig into getting a little bit more insight into how it's done there um, and how they get service into those communities. Yeah, definitely. So I'll have a look at that day. Um, I know there were, there was a specific interest in addressing, um, you know, what they deem to be, you know, lower income communities. And I, I don't know what the threshold or anything was for any of that. Um, but I, I will look at that and, and see if there were examples of, of uh, you know, some some of the suburban, more exurban type type communities that that participated. And Dea, I really appreciate your comment on, um, you know, we really need to be serving the people who are writing. I think that, you know, you would think that would be uh, an intuitive suggestion, but to be honest, I'm I'm not always sure that 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 is the case. And so I, I really appreciate that comment on that. Um, the next thing I feel like is the next follow-up question for me would be, um, you know, where are we starting from? So we have an idea just at least from my own personal experience of how, um, you know, RTD has tried to engage the community in its planning process. And we also had that reimagine work that's been going on um, that was happening prior to this group. And so um, I think it would be interesting to not only just get, you know, an understanding of, of where we're starting from, where has RTD try to um, achieve this in the past, what has worked, what hasn't worked, and then, um, you know, really, again, just move forward and talking about how this model um, that we're playing around with uh, would, would actually be operationalized and, and work. Um, and it, for me, some of the, the major things that I'm worried about is, you know, governance, of course, um, how do we determine the membership of the sub-regional councils? Um, we've talked a lot about aligning it with TIP, but I think it needs to be more than TIP because TIP is just really your local electeds getting together and making some decisions. Um, you know, having a really robust um, group of people coming together. Um, so the governance structure, and then how does that feed into um, the overall RTD board? Of course, I know um, in my region, you know, I have a great relationship with our RTD director. Um, we have two great ones. Troy's also on this phone call. So just kind of, you know, putting that in there, buddy. But um, <laughs> regardless, you know, how do they play into these service model um, councils? And I mean, if anything, I feel like, you know, they should be playing a, a very robust role um, because not only are they, engaging in their local community and getting that community impact uh, influence, but they're also taking that message um, to the, the overall board. Because I know that in the LA Metro um, example, the service councils, you know, came up with their recommendations and then it still needed board approval, which I'm assuming we would continue as well here. Um, so, I mean, really kind of thinking about that structure, what what is the best way to kind of bring those people in and then have our current RTD directors um, essentially, I don't know. I mean, they're, they're our biggest advocates for RTD and they need to be also brought into this process. So I think that that's um, an important 
discussion that needs to be happened and, and just details that need to be um, put out. So Doug, I guess my next question is how do we, what are our next steps here when it comes to kind of fleshing out this process? And I know we did, I think that's also on the agenda later on, but we did talk about bringing in um, a group of um, kind of like a, a technical <laughs> staff group, which I think could also help drive some of this work. Um, there's they're the people who know our communities the best, right? They're the people I'm talking to um, when we're, uh, you know, outside of these circles. So um, wh where are we at with that? And, and how can we um, come up with a proposal, hopefully, you know, in the next month or so? Because um, I really would like to see something that, you know, this, this group could really start to kind of piece through um, piece by piece. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Just so we um, we've had some conversations internally about it. I, I will tell you, we have not gotten that group together yet. Simply, it was it was over Thanksgiving time frame. We just quite frankly didn't have the time to do it. Um, but we are planning on doing it. I would suggest to you that we're looking at probably similar players to what we have in the when we looked at this regional sub regional dual model for the tip conversation. And anybody, I mean anybody, can join in on this right and have a conversation. But we're we're not gonna we're not gonna have a real formal process for them. It probably is more like a, you know roundtable conversations, kind of free flowing of, of of thoughts, those types of things, and and we'll keep track of of directions that um, that might look promising for for your consideration. But we do, you know, we would like to get that group together because I mean I know they have ideas. They email me all the time with uh, with ideas on the governance. So. Um, so we, you know, right after this call tomorrow, I would suggest to you that we're going to reach out to some people, including everyone that has been actively involved in these conversations from staff and RTD staff and um, and CDOT staff, and just just get a group together and let's let's start having a conversation because I would like to have a group that you guys can utilize, you know, and and, and quite frankly, and even help us do some research as well. So it will yeah, be established. Do you have? Do you have Boulder County on that staff team? Oh yes. Excellent, because they they volunteered and <laughs> were voluntold both, but no. <laughs> no, definitely so. Go ahead, Lynn. Or Troy, you want? I um, you know, I think that's that's a good way to go. Uh, you know, I'm I'm listening to, to all of this, and I think there's some really good ideas. Next week, I think Deborah Johnson is coming into the accountability committee meeting, and I don't know if that's the right place to do it, but she has a lot of experience. I think I've said this before with um, the LA Metro system, and uh, uh, I'm not sure how well their system works. So I think there's, uh, in fact, I think that they took service planning back from the local um, uh, regional councils, and, and so there's a lot to be learned there. And just, um, you know, in terms of, uh, I, I still think getting some of the service planning nuts and bolts um, or, or some of the process, you know, how um, it, you have to look at how the different categories of service work, the um, uh, all the different pieces, the, the dispatch and, um, you know, there's a lot of details that I think would be really helpful. Um, starting with Deborah and, and then some of the others. I have a meeting with her on Thursday to talk about some of this. And um, you know, I think it, it, that would be one of the next steps you would want to take. Yeah. Lynn, I'll tell you this. I had a I had a one-on-one um, -on -one with Deborah, golly, I think it was last week. And we talked just real briefly about the concepts, you know, her, her experience back there. So um, I'm going to reach out to her and have a, you know, just a more specific conversation about about her experiences out there. But just to okay. clarify, they, you know, the, the the regional councils out there, they did remove the operations aspect of that and centralized operations. But service planning is still being done by by the by those um, regional councils. Okay. So they come up with a recommendation, and then that's that's shared and ultimately voted on by by the uh, LA Metro Board. Great. If you could send me that presentation on the transportation, uh, the planning, uh, the community-based process. Um, oh yes, definitely. I'll send it out to everybody right after. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. This is 
um, Jordan Sanchez. I just wanted to ask a quick question, um, whether that staff technical meeting would be open to the public um, or if it would be an internal um, meeting. Jordan, no, all of our meetings are open to the public. Yes, they will be. Great, thank you. Julie, just, um, I uh, am still very interested in learning from RTD the results and that, that were referenced in Reimagine about the, the, the lines that actually saw ridership continue through COVID. When mm -hmm. we talk about serving the people that need it, I still don't know what that is. And it's been something that's been referenced a lot. I don't know if anybody on this call has seen that, seen those routes and seen what the ridership numbers have looked like during COVID on some of the rides that um, that uh, did better. I don't know what the right word is, but you know, saw the ridership continue. And I, I think that's an important part of it. And another thing I wanna really kind of go back to um, is this idea of having a backbone system that really is, you know, RTD's um, board that kind of made sure that that system is run and, and service planning and operations and efficiencies. And when we talk about these local councils, it's it's they're advocating for what the service needs are in their specific communities, but then also tweaking the programs so they are meaningful in the communities. So Douglas County. You know, our largest food bank, there is no public transit to our food bank. The only way you can get there is to get in a car. Um, and, and so I want to make sure we don't lose that. I also feel like um, we not only have to serve the people that need us, we have to increase ridership. And I think we can't lose sight of that for this organization to be viable. We've got to serve the people that need it, absolutely. But we also have to make it a service that people are attracted to and want to be using. And um, I think we heard from, um, and I can't remember the gentleman's name, and I can't even remember which committee it was in, but some of the barriers to ease of ridership um, and that things that we could do with the, the rate that the RTD could do with a rate structure and um, how they handle people who are uh, riding for free and, and making it more accessible, making ticketing more accessible. And they've done a lot. So I'm not saying there's deficiencies, but there's always room we can improve. Um, and then the other thing I really would like to continue to have dialogue about is that um, is whether the the existing f elected 15 board uh, member system is the right system moving forward for the organization. And I know everyone has a particular allegiance to their individual representatives who have advocated and done great work for them. But I still question how much sense it makes to have a 15 person board with no subcommittees that, you know, all 15 members have to be part of the budgeting process. I think you lose accountability and do you assume, and I'm nothing, this is not a disparaging comment about anybody that is serving at all. I just know from my work on a number of boards, we've increased efficiencies dramatically when we've been able to create subgroups that really dig into the weeds and you don't have to get 15 people scheduled. So I don't know whether that's um, a gov an internal governance to RTD where they actually set up some functioning uh, subcommittees that allow um, folks to dig in uh, a little bit more on some of the things, but I think that would be very helpful for the organization. And, uh, and I'm not sure why they moved away from that. So um, I don't want, and, and I still question whether or not RTD could be better served by an appointed board that is not aligned to one geographic location that looks at the big backbone system and makes decisions that work best for the entire region, not their jurisdiction. And I'm not, again, this isn't a criticism of any board member about that. I just think um, when we don't have to go back and like I am tonight meeting with an HOA, telling them what I specifically did for that HOA. Uh, I can think about the city as a whole. Uh, decisions are easier for the city as a whole, as opposed to and thinking about the best interests of the city, even if that means there's an impact to one neighborhood or the other. So anyway, thanks for mm -hmm. allowing me to give you my spiel. Thank you. Go ahead, Lynn. Yes, um, the 
the idea of smaller committees is on the schedule for a special meeting on um, next Tuesday. And it's something that some of us have been pushing very hard for. Uh, I think, you know, it's, it's sometime in the last 10 years or so, they went to these committees of the whole. I totally agree. That's not the best way to make decisions. And uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not speaking for the board on that, but um, I'm pushing hard for it. And I think that, that there is a lot of, um, uh, a lot of other, there are a lot of others who agree on that, that, that going to uh, three or four committees that have people who are really delving into it in a smaller group uh, will, will help a lot. For instance, answering some of these issues, having, having a group that's doing some of the same things you're doing with looking at, you know, passes and fares and, and uh, governance and, you know, the local councils and all of those things. Um, I think it will be much more effective and I'm hopeful of that. I echo uh, Lynn's comments. One of the things that um, I've thought about a lot lately, Mayor, is with 15 folks on every committee, um, certainly there has to be a great deal of redundancy in staff presentations and staff time and um, makes for very lengthy meetings. So I'm not sure that's a model that works today like it perhaps did eight or 10 years ago. So I'm, I'm open to look at it as well. I might add that, Lynn if, and Troy, if you think that that's not something that um, is going to be resolved in the short term by the full RTD board, that may be something that the RTD committee, us, wants to recommend um, in our interim report in order to improve effectiveness uh, or at least back up your work to try to get um, solid, smaller subcommittees to do um, the RTD board's business. Thank you. Uh, I'll just add too that um, uh, I don't know what the timing of the report is. Our last board meeting of the year is December fifteenth. Um, so I, you know, I don't know if you'll have a draft that we can can consider uh, at some point before it goes to the legislature. There's some requirements. I think you and I have talked about. Uh, uh, you know, there's there's requirements that the board approve for state reasons not not to approve uh, specific suggestions within 45 days, I think, of a report. Um, but I guess I, if it's possible to get it by December 15th or, or to work on it together, it would be, um, I think, really helpful to have the board's response for y'all and for us. I think our timing is to try to wrap up the interim report by our January meeting, which is on the 11th. Okay. And I know the RTD board has reached out to Doug and asked for a briefing, which for the co-chairs were discussing would be probably best suited for January since we're not done with the report. So right. I know that timing may not be ideal, but I, I think that that's where we're headed. I think that's totally fine. I didn't know if you were trying to get it in by the end of the year, but it sounds like you're a uh... You're okay moving a little further, so that's fine. Thanks. Yeah, well, because it's it's optional. We're not mandated to do it. Right. So figure, let's use the timing that assures the best product by the committee, and that felt like the right timing. Great. I think that this is a good discussion, though, Lynn. Um, and and I think Elisa's point is is important because I've heard from other um, board members about some things that they'd like to see, not only just the, the committee structure, but also um, the simple majority instead of the super majority um, vote to amend bylaws. So, I mean, I think that those things we can include in our report as recommendations, but um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I feel like a lot of that work is with you guys and so any way that we can support you, let us know. But I've, I've heard of similar other kind of internal board governance issues that um, people would like to address. So um, we could definitely in, include that if that's something that could be helpful. Um, Thanks. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I, I'm very hopeful that we're going to be making some some good changes here in the near future, but um, appreciate the, the background support. Great. Awesome. Um, Dea, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I, this is very much a, a reaction to um, 
to just the comment of elected board versus appointed board. And so I just acknowledge that to begin with. Um, I certainly need some some time to just reflect and think. But I think one thing that I just want to make known is that certainly for for a, a, a segment of the population, having an elected board is is important. I do wonder the ne the need to have an elected board that is tied to a specific geography. So if there's a way that we can consider potentially at large board representation or something along those lines, um, just to maintain this this level of representative democracy, I think would be really um, a, a fruitful conversation for us. Um, and I think something may be worth exploring or some sort of hybrid between um, elected and appointed board. Because again, I, I just want to reflect back what I often hear from community um, in terms of the RTD board composition. Thank you. Yeah, I think those are some good points. Um, I see we have a couple other people unmuted. Does anyone else want to jump in? I just want to give the opportunity. Okay. And if not, that's fine too. <laughs> I just wanted to, to make sure everyone could jump in if they needed to. Okay. So, um, Doug, I think that, you know, we, we brought up again um, that the idea of looking at um, perhaps a, an elected versus an appointed board. Um, I know that, you know, there are various structures out there again. Um, and so I'm not really sure what's the best way to kind of evaluate um, something like this moving forward. Um, I mean, I think it's, it would be a big change um, again. And, and so I think we need to be be thoughtful about what would be the purpose of the change. Um, you know, if if our goal is to increase local input in the process of RTD, would the service councils be enough, or do we also need to think about how we're represented on the board um, in addition to that? So, I, I think it's important to take one step at a time, um, and so. I don't know, Jackie, if you have any ideas around what could be some next steps to kind of evaluating um, your concerns over the makeup of election versus um, appointed members. So just for some history, at, at, at some point, and I, I, I think Barbara Gmanix is on here and probably could give it to us, but the, there it was an appointed board and then it shifted yeah. to an elected board. But the reason, what I, I, the more I learn about RTD and the uniqueness of each of the districts i um you know if you look at douglas county it's very very different than than you know downtown denver that's very very different than evergreen and it's very very different than and i'm not sure who has the big vision for bringing it all together um so it is i kind of like the idea of some sort of a hybrid where they're May, or an at-large, folks that are elected at-large, and then maybe that are also representing geographic areas. But um, I don't know how you reconcile parts of Jefferson County and what the need is there, um, and how that one person that has this large swath of this geographic area, compared to somebody who represents a community that they probably see you know, the density of their community, it, it's pretty similar needs, wants, desires, getting to similar places within their community. And um, that, that's, that's where I'm coming from. If you, you know, an appointed member that has this higher level view, I, I, I think could serve the body well if they keep that high level view as they look at it. So, um, you know, it could be at large members that 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 are elected to represent the entire district, um, or it could be uh, folks that are appointed to represent specific constituencies on the board that are have to move throughout the entire district. Um, but uh, and and no disrespect to the folks that have served their time for uh, my community down at RTD, but it is, um, I think it's hard. The needs in my community are very, very different. Not Lone Tree as much, but Parker and Highlands Ranch. I get the phone calls from people that are struggling with RTD issues. 
And they think because we have our light rail stations that somehow I've got some secret code that I can, you know, as bus routes are getting cut to the hospital, that I can do something about that. Um, so I feel like it comes to the mayors and the local electeds anyway. Um, and then I do bring it forward to my representative. And, and so th that is my thinking. I certainly appreciate though the need to tie accountability back to the people that sent you there. But I look at the work that's done in, uh, you know, well, I'm not gonna, Never mind. I'm not gonna say it. I think it should be something that is explored. And, and that is the problem I'm trying to solve is to make sure that there is a very regional look at the entire system, not just the parochial needs. And, and uh, that are so very different within the geographic areas. So that that was, I don't know if that made sense. Jackie, could or could I just segue off of what Jackie started? I think I think any conversation about this needs to start with what Jackie just said. What are the the goals that we're trying to? But the pro, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Um, and then have any discussion of structure flow from that. Because I think that's the key, rather than starting off with, gee, is there a better structure? Figure out the problem we're trying to solve and then seeing if, a, if a structure is what changes what's needed to fix it, and if so, what that would look like, or if it's something else. I tend to agree that making sure that we're having um, a board that has a regional hat on so that they're looking at the whole system is useful as well as having some connection to the to, to the communities as well so i think we all could agree though that we don't want a bigger board right i mean there's already 15 people on this board i mean is that what we're could that be an option is just adding to the current board um perhaps at large appointed members um to represent specific groups of people um, to kind of bring in that regional perspective because I think that you know when you start because if you think about how big these districts are anyway like they're huge like one RTD director is representing hundreds of thousands of people um, and so you know if we're, we're concerned about accountability if we're concerned about um, you know making sure that they have a regional perspective like if you make it even bigger you know what are we setting them up for success um are they able to i don't know i, I think that there's that, that's just one thing i'm kind of struggling with is how do we kind of balance these this really huge districts that we have already and then you know find somebody who who could also bring in a regional perspective so um I, I that's just really where i struggle with this and so and and i don't know if anyone has the right answers but you know that that's just personally where i'm at Rhett, i see you want to jump in yeah i just wanted to mention the idea that you know you, again if you think of what the end point is if you want to get to if you want to have a nine person board for example how do you do that I mean, how do you do that without really changing dramatically the structure of what you've got right now? And if you also want to have some at large and some appointed people, then you know you, you don't want to go from 15 to 18. You want to go down to something like nine. And one of the possible strategies for that is having subcommittees that have representation depending on what the issue is from other places, including potentially that's where you get your appointed people. You have some people that get appointed into the subcommittees. You have some people that are elected and some people that are at large. But the idea of even if you get to nine people, you may still want subcommittees because you want to have expertise in different specific areas. And you, you, you may be able to get that with 15 or 20 or 30 people on a board, but you're not going to get any kind of consensus or any ability to get anything done. So if your goal were to say, for example, have nine people or 10 people on a board, then how do you do that? And how do you still make sure you've got that kind of regional expertise, input and experience to go with it? And Julie, getting back, 
sorry, right. But getting back to your your comment about how do you, they're already large, how do you make them care? I would say if you represent, in that regard, the larger the constituency, the more you care about the region in the sense that you don't, like when you serve on your HOA board, you just focus as your neighborhood and then you move up to the planning commission and then you care about maybe the larger part of the community and then you're on city council and you're carry you, you know your your range or breadth is even more so I, I actually think a nine or ten person board is a very functional size board and if and if the RTD directors were representing larger communities maybe within their community they would have different densities uh, and I have to hear from the folks who or, or the kind of exurbs you know the outer suburbs that have very different needs and service levels and the people who are in more dense commute areas of the community and again have their distinct separate needs and you have to meet all of that so if you're serving a larger population you're serving a more diverse population that is more representative in some respects of the entire region and if we look at you know what our senators do and what our House of Representatives do. I mean, you're right, they, it's our large, vast constituencies and that it is their job to serve everyone. So. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and I agree with that. I think, uh, I mean, it just, I, I, I just worry about how, how big do we make it? And then also um, how, uh, uh, and then, yeah, getting down to that nine or, or nine person board, probably most likely we want an odd number. Um, and so shifting that down to that. Um, going back to what Elise was talking about is what is the problem we're trying to solve? Um, and, and taking it aside from the local service councils, right? Because I feel like the board is a different conversation than the local service councils. What are the things we want to solve when it comes to the board? Is it the fact that it's too large is the concern? Um, we also heard that, you know, is it, um, is, can, how can we approach a hybrid, how can we do a hybrid approach, right? And get some appointed members on there? Who would those appointed members look like? Um, who would appoint them? Would it be the governor? Would it be the service councils? Would it be, um, I don't, yeah, how would the appointment work um, to kind of meet the needs that we're trying to get at, specifically with the board? And then also another thing that also gets me <laughs> to, you know, this is, this is a, a, a volunteer board. <laughs> Um, and I don't think you guys have any staff. Do you, Lynn or Troy? You know, is that something we need to think about as well? Like, Be careful how, how you answer that, Lynn, because we do have tremendous staff, but uh, four people in the board office. Barbara McManus is top notch on every one of these calls. But yeah, four mm -hmm. for the 15 of us. And four for the 15. Okay. They interact a great deal with uh, the senior leadership team. but. Uh, and we are not a voluntary board. We do have a stipend of $1,000 a month. Okay. Okay. You're muted, well, Lynn. Go ahead. You're muted, Lynn. Yeah. I'm, I'm always kind of hesitant to jump in on this topic because, uh, you know, it can sound defensive, but um, but I will say that, that uh, you know, all of these are, are open discussions, but really it's not different from somebody in the legislature who represents their district, but really has to think about the whole state. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that there would be trade-offs, you know, with an appointed board. Um, and again, it comes down to, to who's appointing partially and those sorts of things. I think that we all, uh, you know, at least most of us, I think all of us, um, take seriously the fact that we're wearing kind of two hats. You know, I work closely with Elise and some of the Boulder County people and, and uh, the people that I represent. I know Troy and others do, but at the same time, you know, we're spend a lot of time working on some very difficult budget issues and, and uh, um, 
you know, the, the equity issues and right now who's our ridership and all of those things. So um, it's a, it is a conflict, but it's not one that's unlike other elected officials, I think. If I can just jump in, uh, you know, I, I guess to really pointedly answer your question, Julie, and, and the question that Elise originally posed, I feel like the, the challenge that we may be trying to solve or, or somewhat address is just the board's ability to live into what it is stated purpose is, which is establishing policy and implementing policy and being able to do so in an effective way. Um, which I think that's really what we're trying to address when we look at, well, what's the right structure, what's the right composition, and what's the right um, role and responsibility in order to even accomplish that or, or to, to mitigate that challenge. I will also just say um, this is by no means comparable, but I really appreciate Rhett's comments in, in just kind of working backwards from what is it exactly that we're trying to accomplish because um, we did this as a collaborative, much smaller scale, definitely not trying to shift an entire government, but I'm just trying to think through like what was our own process and that's exactly what we try to achieve is like just how how do we do our work more effectively and efficiently and i think these these now that we've almost it sounds like we're almost settling on the 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 local community councils or whatever these are going to look like just kind of placeholder name but what is it then what does that then free up the board to be able to do i guess is also a question that we probably need to um tackle yeah, no, I think that's a great question, Daya. Thanks. And to that point, Daya, I guess to me, creating these these community councils would then kind of roll up to be providing feedback to the directors. And ideally, I, I still think a nine person board is a more effective board. Uh, and then you have that direct connection back through these local service, whatever we call them, committees, uh, that gives you that nexus back to the community but also gives the, the directors this broader perspective of we've got to serve the outer suburbs, the suburbs, the densifying suburbs and the, and the core city. And we've got to keep this big regional picture in mind. And, and I guess I just have heard some stories about really parochial votes that have taken place down at the RTD board. And so that might be part, and that, could be a very different board than the board that's here today. Um, but we we run into it with vote with votes on uh, legislative issues at our state where the metro area, one can argue, isn't getting its fair share of transportation money and that a lot of it is going, the population and the lane, um, the, the service miles driven in the metro area far outweigh the outer region. But if you look at how transportation dollars are funded through the HETF formula, it goes, it, it very much favors the less populated areas, depending on how you calculate it, right? So I, yes, this does happen at the legislature. They are asked to to, to address broad constituencies. Um, and I would argue that if you make the person representing Douglas care as much about what's happening in Denver, there is, and, and that you can't do, I understand, but I, I just think it does make a more effective board. No, thank you for those comments, Shecky. I, yeah, I, I think it's tough, right? Because, um, you know, when I think about transit issues that are in my community, they're a lot different than um, where they are in some other communities. I mean, we're a suburb, so um, that alone, our, our geography is very different, which, brings us to, to have different needs. Um, and so uh, addressing that. Um, so I, I think that, you know, this has been a great conversation. And I think that we now have two kind of main focuses um, that this uh, committee is going to continue to move forward on. And one is continuing with the local service model um, idea and, and continuing to, to flush out that idea. But now, um, I do think it's appropriate to add in kind of like a, uh, our, our second priority is as we, you know, create, um, you know, the idea of a, 
an increased local influence in this process, I guess, if you will, you know, what does that feed up into? So if you have these service councils, how do we feed up into the larger board and what does that look like? Um, and so I only have about four minutes left. Um, so, but I do just want to point that out to Doug that I do see now like two highlights um, of, of conversations we're going to need to continue to move forward. Um, so I do want to just allow final comments um, on this topic at hand before I move on to our, our final agenda item I didn't get to real quick. So any, any final comments on, on this discussion of the RTD board itself and, and the structure of that? Okay, not seeing any. I am going to move. Real quick, I, I haven't said much today, but I absolutely agree uh, with Jackie. I, I think having a smaller board, um, I don't know if we can do anything much more about the electeds and then having the subcommittees, um, but I don't want to be repetitious, but at least let you know what, what my mind was. Thank you. Thank you so much for speaking up. I appreciate it. Um, so the final thing that we were just going to touch on briefly um, was the preliminary report outline um, that is in your packet. And so really, as you can see, it's just an outline at this point, but um, and, and um, Elise has already talked a little bit about our timeline of, you know, we're shooting more for like a January release of this. Um, and and Doug, I would, I think it's important for at least this governance subcommittee to at least highlight the two things that we are now going to be focusing on, um, the service councils and then um, the RTD board structure. And so just so that everyone can get an idea of, you know, essentially what are some of the things that um, could be going in this report. We don't have any final recommendations as a subcommittee as of today. Um, and I don't think we're going to be having any, you know, probably, um, in the next you know, couple of weeks or whatever, we have a lot more work to do. Um, and so it's really just a, a status report of where we're at, where our conversations are going, what are some of the information that we've kind of parsed through at this time. So um, wanted to just briefly over, go, that, go over that for this group. Um, our next steps are, so Doug, I have you reaching out to our technical staff um, right. to start you know, getting them looped into this process. Um, and I feel like um, I would like to have an action item or next steps, and maybe it's just further discussion, I'm not quite sure, um, for to continue this RTD board discussion. So, okay, so Miller Hudson, he put in a comment, voters overwhelmingly approve the current structure and for good reason, absent public testimony and district-wide hearings, this conversation is largely Okay, thank you. Um, so what is gonna be our next um, kind of action item, if you will, to continue this discussion about um, the RTD structure and um, governance? Julie, really, yeah. I, um, so our next meeting is on December 21st. So at that meeting, I, I'm planning on having at least some type of draft of what the governance subcommittee um, component narrative would be in our in our preliminary report for you guys to have a look at um you know, we can begin to have that conversation about um the you know the board makeup or structure of, of the rtd board if you wish i will tell you that um the other part of this and you know on this regional sub-regional model that um bill Saroy and his folks in his office they are going to be coming back to us and and presenting to us kind of their concept of their core of the core system or you know the regional system versus the the local system and it gets to some of the questions that mayor malay had at the last meeting um okay. they're they're working on that now uh, the 21st probably won't be the case because i think bill is actually on vacation that day so we'll look at early january our first meeting in january to do that um but so we do have time to begin the conversation about the um about the board structure if you guys so desire but i I've got a lot of information today as a result of the comments that I think I can incorporate into our governance narrative for a preliminary mm -hmm. report. So I thank you all very much. Something Daya said, I, I think that really makes a lot of sense. It really resonates with me about, you know, if you establish these regional, sub regional, this regional, sub regional structure, I mean, what does this allow the board to do? What does it free up time for the RTD board to actually do? I, mean, I think that's a great question. Um, I don't know what the answer is, but I mean, I think it's worth exploring and, and with Len and Troy too, just to, you know, kind of flush that out some, right? I mean, 
really, I mean, you know, as you guys providing that policy directive for for RTD, um, you know, removing some service level conversations from 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 the list of things you have to do. I think it's it's a worthwhile conversation, I think. Great. Awesome. Well, we are over time. And so I want to respect everyone's evening. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. It was really robust and it will continue. We have a lot more to say about it, I think. So um, everyone have a good evening and we will see you on the 21st. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.